All right, boys and girls, chapter nine in Stout Hearted Seven, chapter nine. Indians appeared, the first the travelers had seen for some time. The children were afraid of them until Captain Shaw said these called themselves Dr. Whitman's Indians and seemed friendly. One of them even came leading an ox that had been left behind and had recovered enough strength to go on. The Indians had learned to raise potatoes and were willing to trade them for guns or clothing. Some men took off the took the shirts off their backs to buy three or four potatoes. So starved were they for starchy food. The saggers cart was so much lighter than the other wagons that they often got ahead of the train and Dr. Dagon would stop and let the others catch up. No one wanted to be alone for very long. One day, while they waited at the top of a hill, freezing in the bitter wind, the doctor suggested they go down beside the creek out of the wind and have a cup of tea to warm themselves. Tea was one of the few supplies they had left. Rain had fallen in the night, and the wood that Frank and Elizabeth gathered was so wet that it would not catch fire. Thinking he would help along a tiny wisp of smoke, Frank unpenned his powder horn over the pile of wood. So his powder horn is what they would hold their gunpowder in. So it was a little horn shaped and it, would ha it had gunpowder in it. So he thought, well, if I sprinkle a little gunpowder on the wood, then maybe it will catch flame. Instantly, the horn exploded in his hands and knocked him sprawling. He jumped to his feet, feet, dashed to the stream and plunged his head into the cold water. Are my eyes red? He asked in the anxious doctor who ran after him. John and the girls waited while the doctor examined Frank's eyes. Then reassured by his verdict that there was no serious damage, they burst into the laughter at the sight of their brother with his face black and his eyebrows and eyelashes burned off. It was one of the few things they found to laugh at during those harrowing days. Slowly, the company made its way along the Burnt River over the divide to the Powder River, then into the beautiful Grand Ronde Valley, where there was plenty of grass and a fine clear stream. It would have been a good place to rest for a few days, but it was now near the end of October Snow would be coming soon in the Blue Mountains, looming just ahead. So let's think about it. They left in April, the end of April, May, June, July, August, September, October. They've been on the, on the trail for almost six months now. The mountain crossing took three days. Captain Shaw tried to encourage the men by telling them that the emigration of the previous year had suffered a much worse time when 40 men had worked five days to cut a rough trail the wagons could follow. Still, this was not much comfort to men who had to double their teams to pull the wagons up each steep slope, chain the wheels, and tie logs on behind to hold them to the grade growing, going down. The last day they woke up to snow, falling gently through the pine forest. Toward evening, the wagons reached an opening in the park-like pine forest where the people could see spread below the great valley of the Columbia River. So they're getting to our area, my friends. 300 miles yet to go along that river before we re reach the Willamette Valley, said C Captain Shaw. John was standing near, mused. That's where Papa wanted to take us. So that'll be where we'll go, Frank said firmly. Catherine shifted her weight from her aching leg to her crutch. I thought we were going to the Whitman mission. That's only a perhaps. What if they don't want us? The question stayed in Catherine's mind all the next day as the cart slid and rolled down what must surely have been the longest hill in the world. When they reached the Umatilla River, part of the travelers made camp to rest and repair their wagons and to replenish their food stocks from the potatoes and flour offered for sale by a man Dr. Whitman had sent to the Umatilla camp. Some of the immigrants complained about paying, thinking the doctor should give them a few supplies for free. 
After all, he was a missionary, wasn't he? But he has to buy seed and pay men to help him, Aunt Sally said. She bought as much as she could pay for, and the family had its finest taste of bread in weeks. The potatoes were almost as good. The Shaw Company had come over the Blue Mountains by a different route from that used by the Whitmans eight years before, and to get to their station, it was necessary to turn back eastward about 40 miles. Only those who were ill or desperately in need of more supplies than were available here made that extra journey. All who could went on toward the Columbia and the trail westward to the Dalles. There, at the foot of the Cascade Mountains, they would have to build or buy rafts to carry them down the river to Vancouver and the valley. Already, when anyone said the valley, he meant Willamette Valley. Captain Shaw left his family camped with the Sagger children while he rode horseback to ask if the missionaries would take the, would take the orphaned family. After he left, Aunt Sally helped Catherine wash out a dress for each girl, and John borrowed her dull shears to cut off their tangled, matted hair. Uncle Billy, as they called the captain now, rode back to camp late the second day after the girls had gone to bed in the cart and the boys in the tent. Catherine heard the crackle of flames and the sputter of grease in a pan as Aunt Sally cooked his supper. How did you come out? she asked in a low voice. They have already heard about the Sagger children. Wagons have been coming in for months. Will they take the children? At first they said no, but they are very religious people. Mrs. Whitman finally sort of left it to the Lord, I guess. If he sends them to her, she will have to take them. That is, if no one else can or will. I told her how it was with us. Anyhow, I don't believe that old cart would hang together long enough to get to the valley, and the children are too weak, especially the two little ones. She said she would take the girls for the winter. Not the boys? Oh, no. She can't mean to separate them after their parents begged that they be kept together. We must not judge her, Sally. She's been sick a lot, her husband told me. And anyone can see she's not too much to do right now, that she's not, that she's got too much to do right now. People running in and out all the time, enough to drive a person crazy. Children all over the place. Are they hers? I don't know. Never asked. Some of them look half naked, or looked like half breeds, Sally. I feel sick about this. I, if I just knew where we were going to live, how I am going to feed my own family. I know. Why, if we had a house, Billy, like the Whitmans, I'd never let these children go. But we can only do what we can. When will you take the girls over there? We'll start tomorrow morning. Let the boys go along. Once she sees them, maybe she'll change her mind. She doesn't strike me the kind that changes her mind. But anyhow, let the boys stay with them as long as possible. Catherine lay still, hardly breathing. Had John and Frank heard? How could she and her sisters live without them? I don't like Mrs. Whitman, she told herself. I don't care if she is a missionary. I don't like her. In the morning, when Aunt Sally was cooking their breakfast of boiled potatoes, Catherine said, Do you know where Rosanna is? Mrs. Perkins had her last I knew. I don't believe they've come down from the mountains yet. Honey, you mustn't feel too bad if the baby isn't alive when they get here. She was awfully weak last time I saw her. But she's tried so hard to live. She's so, so stout-hearted like the Saggers. I know, dearie. Some things in this life we just can't understand. She took Catherine's face between her two rough hands. You have to be brave for the others. Now then, her voice changed to its usual brisk cheerfulness. Let's get all of you dressed into those nice clean dresses. My, but, but you are a fine looking lot of children. You must show Mrs. Whitman you've had a good bringing up. 
Your ma and pa would want you to be nice to her. She's doing a lot for you. Elizabeth threw her arms around Aunt Sally's waist. I'd rather live with you and Uncle Billy. I know, and I wish we could keep you. Suddenly her face crumpled, and then she held up her apron to her eyes. Uncle Billy patted her shoulder. Now, now, Sally, things aren't as bad as you make out. We'll go down to the valley and find us a house. Next spring, I'll come up and get the girls. The boys can come live with us, too. With this promise in their ears, the four girls climbed into the cart. John and Frank came along behind with, with the three extra oxen, their old bossy, and the broken-down cow Aunt Sally had bought. Dr. Dagen cracked his whip, and they were off. Uncle Billy leading the way on horseback. The girls looking out at the back waved to Aunt Sally as long as they could see her. Chilled by the sharp October morning, they huddled together under their ragged blankets until the bright sunshine warmed them. Catherine and Elizabeth sat up and peeked through the hole in the gray wagon cover to see what kind of country they were going to live in. The trail wound around rolling hills covered with tall, dry bunch grass. Not a tree broke the skyline. I hate it already, Elizabeth said. Maybe it will get better as we go on. Catherine was trying hard to be brave, as Aunt Sally had suggested. But as the hours went by, she too was discouraged by the dreary sameness of the landscape. I thought we could make it today, Captain Shaw said, riding up toward, toward dark to talk to the doctor. These crazy hills, they all look alike. The minute you get around one, another one stands in your way. I don't recognize any landmark, but I think it we're still about five or six miles left to go. We might make it tonight, but we could get lost too, so let's camp here. We should get there before noon tomorrow. Our last night together, Catherine thought, and the boys must have felt the same thing as the six saggers huddled together in the cart, too sad to laugh, too tired to cry. Warm sunshine awakened them. The sky was October's special bright blue above the dry weeds along the creek, where red-winged blackbirds darted and scolded. Dr. Dagen had a fire going, and Frank had already milked the cow when the girls climbed out of the wagon. Uncle Billy brought out two slices of bread he had hoarded and divided them. This will keep you youngins going until we get to the mission. Then there will be plenty to eat. Nobody was sleepy this morning. Excitement was in the air. What do you think the mission will be like, Katie? Elizabeth asked. Oh, I suppose like Fort Hall. It will have a wall around it and block houses at the corners and... Indians? Of course, Dr. and Mrs. Whitman are missionaries to the Indians, Papa said. What's a missionary? Matilda asked. Catherine wrinkled her forehead. Something like a preacher, I guess. The long morning dragged away. The children were terribly hungry, but they knew there was nothing more to eat. One thing was hopeful. The road looked more used, and off to the sides, the tall grass, horses stood grazing. Catherine looked out of the front port, the front peephole, just as Captain Shaw rose in his stirrups and waved to someone. Her teeth began to shatter, and she crept back to her sister's, taking Matilda into her lap. I don't want to live with Mrs. Whitman. I want to stay with Dr. Dagen, the little girl said, pouting. Mama and Papa wanted us to come to Dr. Whitman's. I can't remember Mama and Papa. Oh, honey, you must not forget them. Don't you remember Papa's beard? How you like to stroke it? Matilda laughed. It tickled me. Catherine turned to Elizabeth. We must not let them forget, Lizzie. I'm forgetting, too. I try to remember what Mama looked like, and I can't. A lump rose in Catherine's throat, not remembering Mama, her soft hair, her sparkling eyes. Uncle Billy rode up to the cart and turned back the ragged cover. Now you girls watch. You'll see your new home soon. The road swung around the base of a big hill and entered a broad, level valley. 
Straight as a string, the trail led toward buildings off in the distance. Off to one side, a blue pond rippled in the autumn breeze. Half a dozen white ducks swam there. Catherine was astonished to see that they looked exactly like the ducks on the pond in Missouri. She saw no walls, no blockhouses. The road passed a square two-story house built of gray adobe bricks where children played in the yard and women were hanging washing on a line. She saw other buildings too. That one over there looked like a blacksmith shop. Papa would have liked that. Again, that lump in her throat. Not remember Papa? A network of ditches full of water led from the pond through a garden where pumpkins lay golden among the dry shucks of corn. Beyond the last ditch was a long white house with a green door and green window shutters. It might have been a house in Missouri. It looked like a home. A little of the fear and dread melted from Catherine's heart. Uncle Billy stopped in front of the house, dismounted and walked up the path to the green door. As it opened, Catherine heard him say, Mrs. Whitman, your children are here. Will you come out and see them? All right, they made it to the Whitman mission. All right, my friends, that was chapter nine. Okay, on Monday, I will post the work for chapter nine. Chapter nine uh, worksheet, you may be able to answer some of those questions by yourself. So look at them and see if you can. And then on Monday, you can check your answers with my video. All right, my friends, have a fantastic weekend. I'll talk to you later. Bye.